Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away, and who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked, and a burial place with evildoers. Though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light and fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many, and when pardoned, for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In you, O Lord, I take refuge let me never be put to shame. In your justice rescue me, into your hands I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. Father, Oh, 
because I am an object of reproach, a laughing stock to my neighbors and a dread to my enemies. They who see me abroad flee from me. I am forgotten like the unremembered dead. I am like a dish that is broken. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your kindness. Take courage and be stout-hearted, all you who hope in the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Christ became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So, if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. 
The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, I'll Put your sword back into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made, because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm. And they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning. And they themselves did not enter the praetorium, in order not to be defiled, so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, we do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. But if my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, you say I am a king, and for this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown of, out of thorns and 
placed it on his head, and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid, and went back into the praetorium, and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you, and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. And for this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the Spirit.
Now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, They will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had come first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths, along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. On this somber and solemn day, that day we call Good Friday, that day where we find ourselves, we mourn and are saddened by the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But at the same time, we gather in, together today with hearts full of gratitude and thanksgiving for the very great gift that Jesus Christ won for us through this terrible thing, through his death, the gift and promise of salvation for all who believe in him. And so today is a day of mixed emotions for us. We are both saddened yet delighted, saddened that he had to suffer so terribly and lose his life, delighted that he has gifted us in love with the promise of a better world yet to come. As we heard today and reflected upon the gospel of St. John and his account of Jesus' passion, there's two principal images that I would like to focus in on and reflect with you here today. The first is blood and water. The blood and water that flowed from Jesus' side after it was pierced. The second is the gift. The gift that he shows us of how to move through suffering, being alone on the cross by himself. Blood and water. Why is blood and water so very important? Well, we heard in our gospel today that indeed blood and water, both substances, flowed from the side of Jesus. We heard, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. What is the significance of this? Well, actually, St. John directly gives us the meaning of why blood and water flowed out. He tells us, for this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. It's this second passage from scripture that speaks to the significance of the piercing of Jesus that I want to focus in on. It comes from the prophet Zechariah, where Zechariah says and talks about the Messiah, the one who is to come, that they will look upon him whom they have pierced. Well, when we 
go back to the book of the prophet Zechariah and go to chapter 13, which is after he makes this statement about the prophecy of the Messiah being pierced, we learn what is the effect, what is the consequence of the piercing of the Messiah. Zechariah tells us and prophesies, he says, on that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to purify from sin and uncleanness. A fountain to purify from sin and uncleanness. We are given something miraculous through the pouring forth of the water from Jesus' side. It is a fountain that makes us clean. And so, how beautiful it is that you and I, we see in Jesus' piercing the true meaning of the, of the sacrament of baptism. Baptism is new life that washes away our sin and renews our souls in the grace of God. And how do we receive it? We receive it because of what we remember this very day. Because Jesus Christ's side was pierced with a lance, we can be washed. We can be washed and made clean and anew with the water, the water that he gives us, that divine liquid, liquid that makes us clean. And so today, the church has always taught and celebrates that in the dying and death of Jesus and the piercing of his side, that the church is born, that human beings can become new, a new creation through the gift of the waters of baptism, which Christ offers to us and commands his apostles to go to all nations and to purify, to purify every soul with those beautiful waters and graces received therein. But it's not just water. It's just not water that flows from Jesus' side, but it's blood as well. What is the significance of the blood that comes forth from Christ's side? Well, we also know that Jesus has spoken elsewhere about blood, about his blood, and the meaning that that has. In fact, last night as we celebrated the Last Supper and we look at the Last Supper, we will recall his words where sitting around the table in the upper room with his apostles, he takes the cup of wine and giving thanks and then blessing over it, he says, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The blood brings about what? A new covenant. And so the covenant that Jesus gives us through the piercing of his side, through his death, is for us a brand new relationship. It's a mark. It's a seal that we receive on our bodies and in our souls. St. John Chrysostom so beautifully speaks to the blood of Christ in this moment of the piercing of our Lord. He observes himself stating, in those days, when the destroying angel saw the blood on the doors, he did not dare to enter. So how much less will the devil approach now when he sees not the figurative blood on the doors, but the true blood on the lips of believers, the doors of the temple of Christ, the true blood on the lips of believers, the doors of the temple of Christ. Christ washes us in his blood as well. The blood was so very important, for we remember that during the first Passover, when God was going to liberate the Israelite people from Egypt, he commanded them to sacrifice a lamb, and then take its blood and to swab it, to put it over the lentil, of their doors, of their homes. And the significance of the blood was such that when the angel of death passed over Egypt, it would recognize through the sign of the blood on their doors that they were different, that they were God's children, that they were God's special possession. And so death did not touch the Israelites. And so too, you and I, 
so many, many years later, have the privilege to have the blood of Christ on our lips every single time we receive the Holy Eucharist. The entrance to our temples, as St. John Christum, Chrysostom says, is marked, and we carry a special seal when we communicate with the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, washed and marked with his blood, sealed with that precious gift, we too know that when we communicate with him and renew that covenant every time we receive Holy Communion, we too will forego death, just as the Israelites did on that very first Passover. Now, one of the great tragedies of this pandemic is that we cannot gather in this church here today and receive Holy Communion as we normally would have. We cannot communicate and be washed in the blood of Christ and renew that seal. However, nonetheless, we know. We know that our faith is a faith that exists principally within the heart and that our faith knows as well that God cannot keep himself distant from those he loves. And so today, even though we cannot communicate physically with our Lord, we remember that moment where he died on the cross, and no one could communicate physically with our Lord. But at the same time, Jesus was present to you and me. And so while we wait to receive the Holy Eucharist physically again, in our bodies and our souls, and to be marked with the blood of Christ as we communicate with him, might our waiting be a hopeful, a hopeful one, knowing that just as the crucifixion and death of Jesus passed, so will this pandemic moment, and we too will find ourselves together with the God, with the Jesus, whom we love so much once again. How do we move through that? How do we get through this difficult time? Yes, we do have marvelous graces and mysteries that Christ has given to us in his blood and his water and baptism in the Holy Eucharist and the gift of new life. But how is it practically that we, as human beings, endure this terrible moment of isolation? Well, Jesus shows us something special in the second image that I would like to focus on with you here today. And that is the image of himself up on the cross, by himself. Jesus is by himself on the cross, but not alone. He's by himself, but not alone. What do I mean by this? Well, what I mean by this is that often in our lives, we can find ourselves by ourselves. Essentially, this is what the coronavirus has done to society and done to us personally. We can't go to work. We can't go to school. We can't go to the park. We can't even go in our cars and watch a sunset without getting a ticket. We can't do anything outside of our homes. We can't be with strangers, much less our friends, without keeping six feet of distance. And what do we feel? We feel isolated. We feel by ourselves in this moment. And it doesn't feel good. It's frustrating. It bothers us. And for many, this isolation depresses us and causes a certain darkness to eclipse over our lives. Well, darkness is eclipsing over our lives right now. But nearly 2,000 years ago, darkness eclipsed over Jesus Christ's life. So how is it that he got through the suffering? How is it that he got through being by himself? Well, he did it because even though he was by himself, he was never alone. And that is the lesson that you and I need to take to heart this day as well if we are going to move through the isolation of this pandemic, that you and I, we are not alone. How are we not alone? We simply look to Jesus. When Jesus began his agony in the garden, the beginning of his suffering, Jesus tried to find company in his apostles, and Peter and John and others, but they fell asleep. But even without their company, Jesus was not alone. For Jesus was in intimate prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane with his Father, his Father in heaven, and who, with whom he had an active conversation and dialogue. He spoke, Father, if it be according to your will, let this cup pass from me. But my, my will, 
but yours be done. And what was the effect of this conversation of Jesus crying out in pain to his Father in heaven in that garden? It was nothing but consolation. For after suffering, Jesus was also consoled. And the gospel reports to us that the angels of God came and ministered to him. While Jesus was suffering on the cross, he spoke to his Father. In heaven, he said to him, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was an active dialogue with his Father, who loved him so much, who loved him from all of eternity because he was one with him from all of eternity. And what was the consequence of that? Well, praying Psalm 22, Jesus was not just simply crying out in pain, but Jesus also knew the conclusion of Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was a movement of trust, a message of hope in God, that no matter what I might suffer, Lord, you will be there to save me. And he ended his very life by doing nothing but giving his spirit to his Father, saying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Jesus was by himself, but he was not alone because he prayed. He prayed fervently and consistently and from the heart to his Father in heaven, and it gave way to the gift, the gift of not only consolation of angels, but the gift of new life in the resurrection. But Jesus was not alone simply by praying to his Father in heaven. Jesus also experienced the great company, the great company of other human beings, of his friends. We heard today in our gospel how John, the beloved disciple, was there by his feet, how Mary, Clopas was there as well, as long as, as well with Mary, Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Jesus was supported by friends and family. And so God gives us that second great gift when we're by ourselves. He gives us the gift of being reached out to and reaching out. That's the second of the greatest commandments, is to love your neighbor as yourself. That is the covenantal relationship that you and I need to live, to live through this pandemic that we are experiencing. We need to always allow our hearts to be touched by others, to be loved by others, even when we feel isolated. That means picking up on the phone and calling someone you haven't talked to in a while, answering a text message, writing an email, crafting an Easter greeting and letter and card and sending it out. All of those moments we know. We know the impact of communication with those we love. In the darkest of hours, it can make a rainy day one full of sunshine just because we took the time to say hello even though we are not with that person, even though we are not hung up on the cross, we can still be with those we love who are isolated and by themselves. And we also have to allow ourselves as well to be touched, to be open, to get out of ourselves and to welcome the community that exists in the body of Christ, its church, to touch our hearts. There's a great gift in God's love, and there's a great gift in human love. And if we don't take advantage of those things, then indeed we will truly suffer a terrible pandemic. But if we open up our hearts to the gift of relationship, we'll find that this actually passes very quickly, and in the end, it wasn't really that bad. Blood and water, never alone. Jesus Christ has washed us today through his blood and water and so given us a new birth, a pure soul, and sealed us for the kingdom of heaven. And so today, might we take confidence in our own reflection on the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, that you and I, when we are with him and with one another, we can suffer everything. We can suffer the coronavirus. We can suffer even death itself. And we know in faith we will never be conquered by him who loves us and displayed it on the cross. Let us, dearly beloved, for the holy church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, 
we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty and ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church spread throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayer and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for our Bishop Maluli, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. No, my dear, ever living God, by your spirit, the whole world of the church is sanctified and governed. Hear our humble prayer for our for your sap ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you and the faithful uh, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that, having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who made the church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and the understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in one church. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom, you, whom one baptism is consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God 
God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Oh. 
Almighty, ever living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for a swift end to the coronavirus pandemic that afflicts our world, that our God and Father will heal the sick, strengthen those who care for them, and help us all to persevere in faith. Almighty and merciful God, source of all life, hear health and healing. Look with compassion on our world, brought low by disease. Protect us in the midst of the grave challenges that assail us. And in your fatherly providence, grant recovery to the stricken, strength to those who care for them, and success to those working to eradicate this scourge. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior. 
from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild bulls, my wretched life. I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, give glory to him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not spurned nor disdained the wretched man in his misery, nor doth he turn his face away from him. But when he cried out to him, he heard him. So by your gift will I utter praise in the vast assembly. I will fulfill my vows before those who fear him. The lowly shall eat their fill. They who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your hearts rejoice forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nation shall bow down before him. For dominion is the Lord's, and he rules the nations. To him alone shall bow down all who sleep in the earth. Before him shall bend all who go down into the dust. And to him my soul shall live, my descendants shall serve him. The coming generation shall be told of the Lord, and they shall proclaim his justice to a people yet to be born. These things the Lord has done, they are wonderful in our eyes. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my prayer, far from the words of my cry. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, and graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin, safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and the resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. And bow down for the blessing. May our abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored today the death of your Son in the hope of their own resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord.